it's good to be here because it's important what we're talking about today, and that is the financial crisis and what it looks like 10 years later. It was 10 years ago this month, in March of 2008, that Bear Stearns fell and kicked off the worst recession since the Great Depression. Within a year, American workers' retirement accounts had lost $2.7 trillion. Think about that. Almost a third of their value. Within two years, 8.8 .8 million Americans lost their jobs. Within three years, more than 4 million homes had been lost to foreclosures, and millions more were in danger. The financial crisis wiped out as much as $14 trillion in household wealth. But here's the point I want to underline. The losses were not evenly distributed. Before the crisis, big financial institutions specifically targeted communities of color with mortgages that were full of tricks and traps, stripping wealth from families and from their communities. And when the financial crisis came, those same communities of color got hit a second time, with some neighborhoods nearly destroyed by the concentration of foreclosures. On average, net worth of white families fell by 31% as a result of the crisis, while black families lost 40% of their wealth. Black Americans also saw larger declines in their retirement savings than white Americans. The financial crisis and the devastation that came with it was not inevitable. You know, it was not caused by gravity or by some force of nature. It was brought on by Wall Street and enabled by Washington. The story of the 2008 crash goes back to the 1980s. After nearly 50 years in which regulators had kept a tight watch on Wall Street banks and on financial institutions in particular, and nearly 50 years without a financial crash, basically since the Great Depression, America turned in a different direction. Deregulation became the watchword of the day, or to put it more bluntly, fire the cops. Not the cops on Main Street, the cops on Wall Street. The bank regulators looked the other way as big financial institutions over time found more ways to trick and trap their customers. First through credit cards, then through mortgages, home equity lines of credit, and a raft of new financial products. The SEC, quite frankly, was just outgunned. Regulators were clueless as banks developed creative new trading strategies that took advantage of the old rules. Credit rating agencies signed off on the safety of pools of mortgages that were more like boxes full of grenades with the pins already pulled out. And the wall between high-risk trading and boring banking, those two different kinds of banking, was knocked down. And the Glass-Steagall Act was eventually repealed. Washington turned a blind eye as risks were packaged and repackaged, magnified, and then sold to unsuspecting pension funds, municipal governments, and many others who actually thought the markets were honest. And not long after the cops were taken off the beat and the big banks were turned loose, the worst crash since the 1930s hit the American economy. So for me, the moral of this story is simple. Without basic government regulation, financial markets don't work. And that's worth repeating. Without some basic rules and accountability, financial markets don't work. People get ripped off, risk-taking explodes, and the markets blow up. And that's just a fact. So now it's been 10 years since the last crash. And where are we? The bottom line is that we have made progress, but not nearly enough. And we are at risk for going backwards. Now that the economy is beginning to look good, the lobbyists are again flooding Congress and telling politicians it's perfectly safe to roll back the rules on big banks. And once again, it's working. In the early 1980s, lobbyists convinced Congress to deregulate savings and loans. And over the next decade, 
taxpayers spent $132 billion to bail out those institutions. In 1999, Glass-Steagall, the Depression-era law that created the wall between boring banking and high-risk trading, was put on the chopping block. 90 senators, 90 senators voted to knock down the law. And soon, Congress rolled back other financial rules. And then came the crash of 2008, brought to you by two big to fail banks and the financial <laughs> shenanigans that were legalized by deregulation a decade earlier. And so now, here we are again. Just last month, literally on the 10 year anniversary of Bear Stearns failing, the Senate passed a bill that would roll back key protections put in place by the Dodd-Frank Act, regulations that had been passed in the wake of the financial crisis. I just want to point out what this bill does that just passed the Senate. It takes banks that are between $50 billion and $250 billion in assets. That's 25 of the 40 largest banks in the country. It takes them off the government watch list, giving Trump regulators the license to give them the kind of light touch supervision, just as if they were tiny little community banks. It allows some of the biggest Wall Street banks, the Citigroups and JP Morgans of the world, to potentially hold less capital and sue the Federal Reserve to get weaker rules. And it rolls back consumer protections on mortgage lending, including exempting 85% of banks from reporting data about who they are lending to and at what rates, which deprives regulators of the data they need to go after discrimination. So if I can, I just want to spend a minute focusing on that last provision because it has gotten the least attention of all the pieces of this banking bill. I want to talk about what it means rolling back data collection requirements that help uncover discrimination. There is a long and shameful history in this country of discrimination against African Americans when they try to buy homes. From 1934 to 1968, the Federal Housing Administration led the charge. In a largely segregated America, FHA actively discriminated against black families by refusing to insure mortgages for qualified borrowers in communities of color, while helping white families finance their plans to achieve the American dream. This policy wasn't a secret. Nope. It wasn't the product of a handful of racist government officials. Nope. It was the official policy of the United States government until 1968. That's in my lifetime. And because the federal government had set the standard, private lenders enthusiastically followed Washington's lead. Homes are the way that millions of working families build some economic security, pay down a mortgage, and own an asset that over time is likely to appreciate. A home serves as security to fund other ventures, to start a small business, or maybe to borrow money to send a youngster to college. And if grandma and grandpa can hang on to the home and get it paid off, they can pass along an asset that boosts the economic security of the next generation and the generation after that. But systematically, over many decades, Government policies encouraged mortgage companies to lend only to white borrowers. And those policies cut the legs out from under black families that were trying to build some family wealth. The result is exactly what you would predict. It contributed to a staggering wealth gap between white communities and communities of color. And that gap is alive and kicking today. Here's one statistic from Massachusetts. This is according to a study in the Boston Globe. The median net worth of white families in Boston is $247,000. For a black family, 
median net worth is $8. Think about that. That's something that all Americans, regardless of race, should be ashamed of. Now, when I was traveling around the country in the aftermath of the financial crisis, it became clear to me that the crash had made this problem worse. Subprime lenders who peddled mortgages full of tricks and traps had specifically targeted minority borrowers. And that meant that during the Great Recession, a huge number of minority borrowers lost their homes. And when rising home prices helped white Americans regain some financial security, communities of color with their lower home ownership rates and their higher foreclosure rates were simply left behind. And again, I'm just gonna give you one example on this. According to Pew, between 2010 and 2013, think about this, crashes happened in eight. So between 2010 and 2013, the median wealth of white households grew by 2.4%. But the wealth of Hispanic households fell by 14.3%, and the wealth of African American households fell by 33.7%. In other words, after the crash, while white families began to recover, black and Latino families fell further behind. Lending discrimination is still rampant today in 2018. According to a new report that just came out from the Center for Investigative Reporting and Reveal, in 2015 and 2016, nearly two-thirds of mortgage lenders denied loans for people of color at higher rates than for white people. The problem affects both big lenders and small lenders, and it is nationwide. In 61 different cities across the country, minority borrowers were more likely to be denied a mortgage than white borrowers with the same income. How do we know that? Well, we know that because of data that federal law requires banks to report. That's how we can see how much black families were charged for a mortgage or how often Latino families were denied a chance to take out a mortgage. And we can compare those numbers with white borrowers who have the same incomes and the same credit scores. But of course, we can't do that if the data are missing. And that's exactly what the data that will be cut out if the Senate banking bill becomes the law. I want you all to think about what that means. Without that data, it will be much harder to stamp out mortgage discrimination. Now, while the Senate and the House are moving to roll back financial rules across the board, I actually have a different idea. Instead of gutting rules while the banks are making record profits, let's make the rules tougher so that we don't end up with another financial crisis and another taxpayer bailout. Millions of American families were crushed by the financial crisis after Wall Street gambled with their money, but nobody went to jail. And sure, Regulators went after the banks with fines, but executives just passed those fines along to the shareholders. Then the executives got big bonuses and usually were able to keep their own jobs. And let's face it, this bad behavior didn't stop with the financial crisis. Just take a look at Wells Fargo. So last month, I introduced a bill called Ending Too Big to Jail. The bill would make sure that if financial institutions break the law and scam their customers, the CEOs are held accountable. I have this crazy idea that if CEOs break the law, they ought to go to jail just like anyone else. Now my bill does three major things. It creates a law enforcement unit that's completely focused on investigating crimes at financial institutions. Think of it as a vice squad for Wall Street. Second, it requires senior executives at banks with $10 billion or more in assets to certify annually that they have conducted due diligence and found no criminal conduct or civil fraud within the financial institution. In other words, no more hiding in the corner office. 
And third, it gives courts oversight of deferred prosecution agreements between the Department of Justice and companies that have broken the law, allowing these companies to move forward and the agreements to move forward only if a judge determines that those agreements are in the public interest. In other words, no more secret deals. If CEOs are generally, genuinely concerned that they will be hauled away in handcuffs if they break the law, maybe they will run a much tighter ship. That means less fraud and less risk of another financial crisis. So look, I have other ideas for strengthening the financial system. I think we should reinstate Glass-Steagall so that boring banking is separated from high-risk trading. I think we should enhance oversight of derivatives market and fund our federal agencies so they have more resources to stand up to Wall Street. And if we're going to take another look at our financial rules, these are the kinds of bills Congress should be passing, not more rollbacks that help banks that put everyone else at risk. What I can't understand is why we put the bank's to-do list aside and what I can understand is why we can't put the bank's to-do list aside for just a little while and work on the things that will really help the American people. Things like passing DACA, reforming our criminal justice system, or passing sensible gun regulations. Getting relief for Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands or helping those who are suffering from the opioid crisis. Providing support for people drowning in health care costs or finding solutions for working families and addressing the student debt crisis. There is so much that Congress could do. There is so much that Congress needs to do to make our financial system more resilient and to tackle other problems that Washington is ignoring. That is our mission. That should be our mission, to make Washington work again for working families. So thank you all for listening. Thank you for being part of this. And now I'll turn it over to Jasmine and we'll do a little Q&A. Yes. All right. So. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jasmine Goodwin. I am a senior journalism major, graphic design minor from Columbia, South Carolina. And I am the editor-in-chief of The Hilltop. And on behalf of the student body, I'd like to welcome you to our university. Um, and you know, let's get right into it. <laughs> um, so let's go back 10 years. Um, during 2007, 2008, we entered the longest economic recession since World War II. Um, from a college student perspective, hardly any students on this campus were thinking of this or directly affected by the Great Recession, but more so perhaps indirectly through a parent, family member, or family friend. Can you tell us why does, practice, uh, why does protecting consumers and community from bank power and financial fa failures matter today, especially to college students, and where do we now stand? Okay, so that is a good question. How about if we start it, I, I want to see if I can start this at kind of the 10,000 foot level. I think the fundamental question is who does government work for? It, for me, that's like where everything intersects. Is government there for giant financial institutions? That certainly was the case in the run-up to the financial crisis, that uh, it was a case of whatever rules they wanted, knock out regulations, do whatever these big banks wanted, and the big banks made profits like you wouldn't believe. And what happened? They crashed the economy and then turned around to the taxpayers and said, how about $700 billion for a bailout? We need some help here. It's that kind of attitude that we're here to help the big guys and not really anybody else filters down to everything that touches your lives every day. So watch what's happened over the past several decades. Investment in young people who are trying to get an education just keeps going down. Cost of college keeps going up. The need to get an education keeps going up. The difficulty of just making it into the middle class keeps going up. And yet, how much our government, our democratically elected government, is there to be a partner for young people who are trying to get an education just keeps going down. Pell Grants, as a proportion of what it costs to go to school, down. Student loans, oh man. They'll make sure that you got plenty of money for student loans. Oh yeah, let me tell you something that shifted dramatically on student loans. Back in the day when 
My generation needed a student loan. Federal government put money on the table so your loan was subsidized. That is, you were getting a student loan at a rate that nobody else could. Plus, they looked at those loans and said, you know, every time a kid gets out there and gets an education, someone whose parents couldn't afford to write a check for college, that's good for all of us. That's part of our national defense. That's what they called it. My loan was called a national defense education loan, right, NDEA. And they said, as a result, if you go to work in something that's good for the national defense, then we're just going to knock 10% off your loan the first year. And the second year, another 10%. And the third year, another 10%. And I'll just tell you one little part about how they defined what was in the national defense back in those days. If you became a public school teacher, that was in the national defense. So as soon as you signed up to teach school, they knocked 10% off your loan the end of your first year. Another 10% your second year except for folks like me. I was a public school teacher, but I taught special needs kids. And our federal government said, you know, that is so important and so much in our national defense. You, we knocked 15% off your loan. So we're gonna help you get rid of those loans. In other words, we're gonna charge you less, we're gonna help you get rid of them. Where are we today? We live in an America today where the federal government makes a profit off the backs of student loans. They're on target to make billions of dollars in profits off student loans. And where does that money go? They're taking money in from young people whose parents can't afford to write them a check to go to college, and then they're turning around and doing tax breaks for billionaires and giant corporations. So we can do example after example on this. But you have to care about this because all the pieces are tied to each other. When the financial services industry gets to pretty much write whatever rules it wants, it ends up, it ends up putting out mortgages that blow up people's homes. I mean, not, not physically, but they move you out on the street all the same. When they get to write whatever rules they want, then they end up with student loan servicers who don't care about you. They just figure out how to cut costs. And that means whatever program they put you in, however much you can't reach anybody on the phone, they don't care, right? It's every piece of this relates to every other piece. For me, this is ultimately about how our financial system works, but at the very same moment, it's about how our democracy works. I don't know, Jasmine, does that cover it? Yes. Okay, good, good. Um, you are also a champion for the U.S. Consumer Financial Bureau Protection under the Obama administration. You bet I am. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, a legislative response to the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, and the Great Recession. Um, can you? It is currently under fire in terms of possible elimination by um, Mike Mulvaney, the director of the Office of Management and Budget for President Trump. Um, what can people in the community do? What steps can they take to protect the legislation that protects us? Okay, that's a great question, Jasmine. Let me start with why you should care about something called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, CFPB. Here's the reason why it matters so much. We've had a lot of laws in America, actually for a very long time, about interest rates and certain things that had to be disclosed on loans and so on. But the deal was, it doesn't do any good to put a law in the books if there's actually not a cop on the beat to enforce it. So all of the consumer laws around mortgages and, and, and credit cards and payday loans and all these different kind of loans were scattered among seven different federal agencies. And no one of those agencies thought they were the ones really responsible for it. And so when the bad first credit cards starting in the 1980s when the credit cards just got worse and worse and worse, when they started sending out these envelopes full of pre-approved, zero for interest rate, and then it turns out back on page 31 of the, they even call it this, they called it mice type, uh, the little tiny fine print, it turns out, oh, well, there was a fee here and an interest rate increase over there and another little trick over here and another trap over there, so that the effective interest rate often on these credit cards would turn out to be Instead of 0%, well, 15% or 20% or 30% or 45%. They just kept going up and up. And the same 
then migrated over. This was a part of what started going wrong with mortgages, uh, student loan servicing, all the different parts through financial services. And basically the regulators, they pretty much just sat on their hands. They pretty much just looked the other way. They pretty much just listened to the giant banks that walked in and said, don't worry about this. We got this totally under control. Ah, we totally were on top of this. No problems at all. Right up until the day the economy exploded. And how did this economy end up flying over a cliff? I'll tell you one way to think about it. This economy crashed one lousy mortgage at a time. One family that got cheated at a time, just over and over and over, until finally the whole thing came down. So one of the things that came out of this, I had had this idea to build a consumer agency, and the basic idea was to say, pick up those laws that are out there, add in anything else we think is necessary, and then create one agency and give them the responsibility, give them the authority that they need, give them the tools they need, and then hold them responsible for leveling the playing field. So that when you take out a credit card or when you've got a checking account at a bank, you don't get cheated. That's the basic idea behind the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. It's actually not any fancier than that. And here's the deal. Um, so we go into the fights over will the agency survive. And the banks understand this, even after the crash. The banks didn't give up. They didn't say, you know, we were bad, we're real sorry, awful sorry about how we crashed the economy, and let's figure out some sensible regulations. Nope. The banks spent more than a million dollars a day lobbying against the financial regulations that ultimately became the consumer agency and Dodd-Frank. Think about that. We're spending more than a million dollars a day for over a year. They stayed after it, right? To try, and what was number one in their crosshairs was to get rid of that consumer agency. The agency that would just help level the playing field. That's all it was designed for. You, just, you can sell credit cards, you can do mortgages, you just can't cheat people. You just can't trick people. You just can't trap people when you do it. And there was a lot of back and forth. I was still teaching at this point. And I, I want to put this part out there. President Barack Obama, he stood up for the agency. There were lots of negotiations that went on, some in open and a lot behind closed doors, where people said, tell you what, we can get this thing through on all the other provisions if we'll just basically throw the consumer agency under the bus. And he was the one in the room who said no. We're going to keep the consumer agency. We're not going to let people get cheated. So we get the agency passed into law. He signs the paper. I was there when he signed it. He asks me to come to Washington for a year to set up the consumer agency, which I did. And then Rich Cordry becomes the director, uh, who's now actually running for governor out in Ohio. Rich Cordry becomes the director, and here's the deal about why you should care about this agency. So I was like, yeah, one more agency. It's been up and running six years now. Would that be right? It has forced the biggest financial institutions in this country to return more than $12 billion directly to people they cheated. Think about that. $12 billion. And how many banks looked at that and said, you know, instead of going with that plan that we had that was going to cheat people, Maybe we'll just back up and go somewhere else, figure out something else. Twelve billion dollars. They've also handled more than a million complaints and helped people get relief. If you have a complaint, by the way, I just have to say this, kind of my commercial to the side. If you have a complaint, if, if you feel like you got cheated out of ten bucks on a fee, on a bank fee that you shouldn't have been charged, if you feel like you put down money on a down payment on a home, and they now won't return your $11,000, whatever it is. You can file a complaint with CFPB. You just do it online. Go to CFPB.gov. You can file it online. The thing gets basically stamped that the CFPB knows about it. They send it over to the lender that you've got a problem with. A clock starts running. And the lender tries to resolve this thing. And they are resolving it in a, in a very large fraction of the cases. So, doesn't work all the time, but you're moving in the right direction. You've got somebody on your side, and that's the bottom line. Somebody on your side. So now, banks have hated this thing from the beginning. 
Uh, consumer agency never got a long breathing spell when it was much love. The, the banks and their friends on the Republican side of the aisle started hammering on this agency from the day after Dodd-Frank passed, on and on and on. In fact, one of the lobbyists, you'll love this, one of the bank lobbyists on the day that President Obama signed the financial regulations into law, one of them said, it's not over. This is just half time. And then went from there to start on the attack after the agency, after the other financial regulations. So now, uh, uh, President Trump has put Mick Mulvaney in charge of the agency. He's someone who has voted against the very existence of the agency multiple times, wants to get rid of it, is doing everything he can to hollow it out. But here's, here's what I want to say. Yeah, this is tough. But we did everything we could when we built that agency to insulate it from politics. This is something that was very important to the president, it was very important to me. That, and when I say politics, I mean Democrats or Republicans. Everybody who works there, basically, except for the director, who has to be approved by Congress, is a civil servant. And that means they can't be fired by some politician who comes in. They're there to do their jobs. And frankly, they're protected by civil service to keep doing their jobs. And now, Mick Mulvaney is doing everything he can to knock the legs out from underneath the agency. But I keep thinking about the, the people who are at the agency. I was there. Uh, I hired a bunch of them. Uh, of course, more have come since I, since, since I left. But these are people who came because they understood why we needed this agency. These are people who understood that you do need a level playing field. Families need a chance. If they're going to build any economic security in a 21st century economy, they've got to have a they got to have a set of rules that make sure people don't get to skin them. They've, they've got to be able to have a fighting chance to be in the game. And people who came to the agency knew they weren't going to be easy. They were going to be up against big banks. They were going to be up against some really sleazy financial institutions. And the other side would fight hard. So I look at the folks at the CFPB. They're fighters. That's why they're there. They, and they fight from the heart for the right reasons. So I know this is a hard time for the agency, but the agency is still out there. It's still doing its job as best it can, and I still put a lot of, a lot of faith in them. Um, Howard University is founded on the mission of truth and service, um, with many of us possessing an entrepreneurial spirit that is then um, gone on to util be utilized to help develop and serve communities. Um, how important is the CFPP and further legislation that would allow for necessary investments to develop these communities and those that are more underrepresented and underserved than others? Oh, so this is a really good question. Look, capital is what it takes today. People have to have access to money. You want to start a small business, you want to get an education if you weren't born into a family that's rich. It takes access to capital. Whenever you're talking about access to capital, you've got to know you're at least on a level playing field. You know, it's hard enough to fight uphill to try to build something to invest in a future just because of the risk out there, because of speculation, because of the amount of hard work it takes. But to do it when you're fighting in a, in a system that's crooked, in a system that's loaded against you, just makes it ten times harder. So a CFPB to help level the playing field so that more people have a chance. It's the opportunity business. That's how I see this. Um, that's why I think it's critical. 